Susan, thank you very much. And again, thank everybody uh, for, for joining. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, a couple of areas, uh, basically process improvement and processes, but more specifically, an area that's uh, new, that's very popular, and uh, many people are getting into robotic process automation. We'll touch a little bit on business process outsourcing as well, since that's a related, related topic. And then at the end, trying how to integrate all these together. As I said, I, I used to work for Capgemini, which was very heavy into the process improvement in the sort of golden age of process improvement where we had business process re-engineering. Uh, and at that time, it was uh, really key, but we didn't have any tools like we have today with uh, RPA. And I think that's really key. So we really want to talk about some of these tools and how to integrate it all in a fashion that gives maximum benefit to the organization. So let's look at the world today. We all are in various companies uh, that have various degrees of uh, competitive situation, but it's very much a global economy. We saw today from that one uh, freighter that was stuck on the Suez panel, uh, canal causing all kinds of problems, the supply chain issues we're having due to COVID. It's just a, it's a global world. We get all of our LED TVs from uh, Korea. We get most of our chips from uh, uh, offshore uh, or by companies that know how to do it and maybe onshore, but building offshore. So to really survive, companies today have to be uh, competitive. Good enough, which may have been good in the 70s and 80s and even the 90s, isn't good enough anymore. We can still have to innovate. We constantly have to create in new products and services, enhance our products reduce cycle time and costs. Um, you know, it used to be that if we wanted to order something from a catalog, we'd wait a week or two before it comes. Now we can go to Amazon and uh, other places as well. And in some cases it gets same day delivery of a product that we saw in a catalog uh, in the morning. This is an incredible reduction of cycle time. And when companies look to improve, how do they improve? Well, the key is they have to improve through either people, they change people or replace people, add new people, train people, technology, which can go from very simple technology to very complex ERP systems. But fundamental to almost all those improvements is process. And so I really wanna talk about process today and how we go about process improvement. So we're gonna start today talking about process, processes, what they are and how they uh, go forward in terms of various aspects of processes. And then we'll get more into actual improving processes. So what, what are processes? It's simply a sequence of activities that we do. And uh, what nice thing about processes is they're basically the foundation of how actually work gets done. Processes take inputs from a supplier and convert them to outputs and give them to a customer. I may be both the supplier and the customer. If I'm making breakfast in the morning, uh, I the cook, uh, and down here the cook, I provide the inputs, bread, coffee, butter, uh, jelly, and I'm also the customer eating it. But this is a, an example of a process definition based on six sigs, what they call SIPOC, supplier, input, process, output, customer, we always have to remember that their entry criteria and exit criteria is the toast overdone. Do I have to go back and do it again? Did I forget to put uh, uh, cream in my coffee? I may have to go back and brew it again. Uh, all kinds of things. And, and there are people aspects to the process. People today do the work, but tools also do the work. Toasters toast our coffee, we our, our, our toast. Coffee makers create our coffee for us. So a process is all these. And one thing about process, and any of you have any into any sports, uh, competitive, competitive sports of any kind, is that if you do the same thing over and over again in process, things can get better. Processes need to be repeatable before they can be improved. We always have to measure. So if I go to the driving range and I hit a shot and I'm slicing, I'm slicing, I'm slicing, I go to 
uh, an instructor to help me get rid of my slice, I can now go to the driving range or when I actually golf and see, is that slice getting any better? Am I going any further than I have typically when I hit my drives? And, and another thing about process is they tend to be long lasting and enduring. We don't think about it, but once we as humans learn a particular task, it's, it's something that we continue to do the same way. You probably have the same process you follow in the morning from when you get up, uh, shower, dress, eat breakfast, get the kids ready for school, maybe drive them to school or get them off to school and go to work that you follow pretty much every day. And if things change, if these uh, suddenly uh, an issue with the weather and things are different and you can't, uh, the school buses don't run, you, you start doing things differently and it may be each time you do them differently, but we typically, processes don't change. And that's something to remember as we continue our discussion. Processes also can be linked together in what we call value chains. So in the morning I get up, that's part of a process. I, 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 I shower, I dress, those are different, each one adding some more value. I feel clean after a shower, refreshed. I get dressed, I have to select clothes before that. Uh, each of those adds some value. Uh, most, a lot of my consulting has been done with IT organizations, so a lot of my pro examples are gonna be related to those. So typically in an IT organization, we take customer ideas, requests, and to convert them, understand the requirements, convert them to some kind of a solution, deploy that solution, and eventually retire that solution. If maybe customers want a new uh, sales management system, we do an analysis, we select Salesforce, we implement it, and then at some point in time, maybe we find a better tool or a different tool, and eventually the application gets retired. So these end-to-end -end processes, if we look at the entire way uh, companies do work, we'll have what we call core processes. They define key business activities. Uh, most organizations between have five to nine core processes. That tends to fit in with our human way of thinking as we tend to think of, uh, if we get more than seven or eight things, it's hard to put in our mind and keep it in our mind. So we tend to think of a small number and, and these are some examples of IT processes here and business processes here. If you've implemented Oracle or uh, SAP in your organization, they have standard uh, business processes that they start off with, like order to cash. I get an order for goods and services. I now uh, have to convert that to manufacturing and create something to actually deliver to the customer once it's delivered and deployed, uh, they give us cash for having that product or service. Likewise, if I need to provide a product, I may need to order supplies for that product. So I go to purchasing. I purchase those supplies that eventually come in and get remanufactured into some product that we deliver to our client once those the raw materials and materials come in, I have to pay the vendor for providing them. So purchase to pay would be another process. Very often these standard process from ERP systems need to be tailored to our own specific kinds of business. Am I doing die casting or I may do plastic casting? Well, the dyes become a key part of it and those are not easy to make and take a long time and go through a lot of iterations to do that properly, even today, with modern manufacturing techniques. Likewise, if I have vendors today, I may want to look at uh, different vendors tomorrow, or I may have some vendors now have got supply chain issues and I have to look at vendors. And so the purchase to pay may become a much more complicated process than it was yesterday. Um, another key element of core processes is they cause functional, cross-functional organizations. And this is really an area where there are a lot of problems in process automation, whether it's uh, process automation uh, at a high level or even at a low level. We have to be very careful when we look at organizations that those organizations have to implement those core processes in their area. We see a lot of problems is that doesn't happen. 
the application port group doesn't get along with the application development group. The application development group doesn't like the infrastructure group or they don't work together. We're trying to come up with new mechanisms like DevOps and IT to support that. But the same thing happens in uh, the sales process. This marketing and sales work together, sales and manufacturing. Oh, salesmen always overpromise what we uh, we can make, and now we have to jump through hoops to make it, or or they give clients unreasonable expectations for delivery dates. So the real key we're going to run and remember is processes. In order to be effective, they have to be implemented consistently through the organization, and that doesn't always happen. In incoming. The group may call a something, I'm going to do an uh, incoming test of raw materials or uh, not raw materials, but any kind of products coming in for sub-assemblies or whatever. The next department may call that same thing that they're getting is an uh, incoming inspection. And there may be tests that should be done that they don't do because they're calling it inspection. And I, I look my product over but I don't actually run tests on it. So I've seen that happen in many cases where one department calls something one thing and that same activity, that output that I'm getting as input into my de new department is called by something else and we have a mismatch. We don't have a good handshake and we end up with defects. And that's a problem area. Uh, and again, it's a problem area for robotic process automation as well as regular process automation. So we have to be very clear clear on roles and responsibilities. Uh, another element aspect of process is they can be de decomposed. So right now I'm going through various aspects of process to find that so we can use that and we get into more process improvement. Processes start off at a high level, can depose, decompose them into what I'm going to call major processes, which can be decomposed into sub-processes and low-level processes, and that go on and on and on. I think the most I've ever seen is eight levels of process where I was working with a large airline, and if they have a weather incident uh, that caused cancellation of flights, that process got to be very complex because not only did I have to get the people who were trying to get somewhere and canceled somewhere uh, on different flights and maybe another day. But I also had to get the airlines and staff, the pilots and the crew uh, to the right place at the right time to get them planes to the, where they should be so they could fly the next day. And also get try to get in, in a way that I can get back to normal as much as possible. So some processes can very complex. The key is most process improvement is gonna happen at the lower levels of the organization. It may be we look at this and say, oh, we have a problem in testing. We're getting too many defects, but to find out what that problem is, is it uh, to, in the test itself? Is it in the design? Uh, we need to oftentimes dig very deep into the organization and get measurements of what's going on, as well as interviews with people to find out where basic problems happen. Now, why? Do we need to improve processes? It said they're very long lasting. They are, but things change around us constantly. The processes become stale over time. The environment changes. The organization change. We may purchase a subsidiary that now does part of the work we were doing in plant A is now being transferred to another subsidiary. Uh, I was with a, you know, uh, one company that had uh, uh, plants in uh, Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico when it was hit by the hurricanes in uh, uh, a while ago. And they decided to reorganize how they did their basic work so that if that happened again, they wouldn't be all dependent on one plant to provide, in this case, medical devices, which were life-saving devices for some companies. Uh, tools change. Uh, we get, go from Oracle to SAP, and now we find things different. We go from one version of an application to another. I constantly find that, oh, wow, well, that's not so much as the same. We're looking at now going from Windows 10 to Windows 11, and I've had a lot of people saying, well, it's, uh, it's different. This is gone. That's gone. This has been added, and I have to relearn. Again, 
there's something called muscle memory. When we've done something over and over again for uh, weeks, months, even years, it takes time to change. And so we have to go accommodate those changes. And as we change systems, we have to change that. The process itself changes. We may have new company employees come in, they change the process. A new manager says, oh, we let, need to speed this up or want to use a different uh, tool for do something. And probably one of the biggest areas is competition. Our, our, you know, uh, if we're in the business of providing goods by a web, website and, and Amazon comes in with same day delivery, people may now go from us, our two or three days delivery to Amazon just because they want same day delivery. We always want our whatever we want right now. We don't have, uh, as, as human beings, a, a long time to, uh, well, say, well, I, it's okay, I don't need it for a week. We typically want immediate gratification. And processes may not have been designed in the first place. Typically, we have a, a happy path. We go through a process and some uh, unhappy paths. In many cases, there are more unhappy paths than not, than a happy path. And we have very dysfunctional processes and we need to figure out how to fix them before we can really make a lot of improvement. So to be competitive, we need to constantly review and update our processes. If I work for an organization that's ISO 9000 or running FDA a good manufacturing practice, it's baked into the processes. They're very much process architectures. The same with SEI for IT organizations. Uh, if I'm SEI level three or above, Typically, I have, well, I won't say well-defined, but defined processes that I'm following. And typically in those, I have built-in times when I need to review the process. It might be once a year, once every six months, once every two years. They're built into the FDA, and I build that into my training plan, a process review. I build it into my ISO 9000 uh, processes. I build that into the definitions from the SEI in the defined process organization. So we need to constantly review that. And not that we want to, and organizations that I think that don't understand this, they let processes get stale. It's sort of like a hotel that the rooms get stale and suddenly we have a massive amount of improvement we have to make and oftentimes we don't do it and companies don't do it and they get into problems and may actually uh, go out of business. And that's happened um, num numerous times in the last uh, you know century. So let's look when I say process improvement, what do I mean by that? So let's say we have a simple sales and order entry process, what we call the as is process. This is how things work today. And typically between process steps, there are white spaces where we wait. We go in sales, goes finds a prospect, and before we can actually create a proposal for them, there may be a wait time to get the proposal group. Uh, maybe I'm busy working on another proposal. It may be that the client says, I'm gonna issue an RFP uh, at the end of uh, May, and I need to have that RFP responded to by the uh, end of June. And now we've immediately got from today on uh, um, May, uh, early May, uh, almost a, two month delay before we actually finish our proposal. And then there may be time from proposal before we actually go to order entry. Well, now we've got been selected as the vendor. Now the, the, uh, the lawyers have to work out the legal agreements between our two companies. Now the customer decides they want another change to what they had in the proposal. They want something special and we now have to reprice it. And again, maybe even go back to legal again and then products get scheduled, we have to order uh, supplies to manufacture it. There could be white space, what was taking two weeks to provide supplies for a certain product may now take six weeks, and that white space increases. And sometimes uh, it, it's something we create ourselves. I was working with one organization that had entered, uh, implemented SAP in their ordering process, and one of the things they did is in testing, they had a delay of baked into SAP of uh, uh, something like uh, 40 days for testing so that they could actually do some testing to see that everything was working right. 
what ended up happening is the average lead time for a product going through order entry was 45 days. 40 days of built-in wait and five days of actual order processing. Why? Because someone, when they went live, forgot to take that delay out of the system. And this had been operating for years before we found it out. We were tr treated as heroes. We found it out. We took out that 40-day delay, and we went from 45-day average processing time to five. Uh, what a success. But it's just due a, to a defect in the design process. So we look at now the 2B, where we want to be. We typically call that the 2B process, where we'd like to be. And now we try and eliminate white space as best we can. Uh, do we really need that uh, late time? Maybe we, in the proposal stage, we should actually be ordering products uh, for possibly if we have a good feeling about it uh, for manufacturing so we can cut the lead time out of that. Or um, uh, from sales uh, to, to proposals, we can start the proposal early, even though they don't have the RFP, because we know exactly, uh, have a good idea what's going to be in the RFP. So we eliminate white space. We may use robotic process automation to automate the proposal process. And from the proposal, automate what we sold into order entry. So that could be done via a robot versus uh, 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 waiting for people to enter it. We may on a overlap and run some processes in parallel. Uh, that's another way of reducing time. Uh, we might reduce defects, move quality insurance up earlier in the process so we know about defects early and we can get them out of the system before they cause a problem. But we may decide, you know, God, we're not really good at outsourcing uh, at maintenance and operation. Let's outsource that to somebody who's really good at that. So let's outsource that, operate, because that's their specialty. The end result is we do all of these things. We have a shorter cycle time. We've compressed the cycle time. There's less rework because we have less defects, higher productivity, the same number of people able to do almost twice as much work in the same time frame. And the end result for any one process is lower costs. This is our goal. It's always the goal for the 2B. Do we meet it? Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. It's like, uh, I think we saw with uh, True Project, 70% uh, uh, or so of projects don't meet all the criteria for success and there's some amount of failure. The same thing with process improvement products, projects. They don't all work for a variety of reasons. We'll talk more about that later. So now, now that you have an understanding of what processes are, and these, these are my definitions, but I've been used, they're very consistent over time with a lot of others, but they're very aspects of process that we need to understand. Let's look at how we go about process improvement. So there were a number of ways I mentioned that what I'm gonna call business process improvement, uh, that is very uh, human-centric, people-centric, We'll also talk about business process outsourcing, which is uh, another aspect of how do I improve process. And then we'll really focus a lot on robotic process automations. And then we'll look at how that all integrates together. So for a business process improvement approach, and I call it Agile, because I have been teaching Agile since 2000, and I first heard about it uh, when I first heard a talk on extreme programming. To me, this is the way I think everything becomes agile and not in the sense of following a strict agile uh, uh, life cycle, but the fact of iterative and getting work done in small chunks and getting it out to the customer quickly. Uh, we do that, we get that out to the customer and we find out things we never thought about about our solution. And then we can iterate and make it better. So that's the idea of iteration getting real deliverables out to people. Don't just do analysis and analysis. Get it out as soon as, you know, one of the mantras of uh, my view of Agile is as soon as it's good enough so you're not embarrassed, deliver it to the customer. Doesn't have to be a minimum viable prototype. A lot of times you can even just do a simple storyboard and they'll say, 
that's not how I expected it to work. How about this? And you'll say, I never thought about looking at it that way. So it's really key. This approach starts off with a lot of human-centric tools. Before we automate, we have to understand the process. We do, how do we do that? We do that with interviews. We do that with surveys, workshops, looking at processes, looking at output, looking at reports. But key, people are key. Why are people key? Because you really want to get buy-in. If people think everything is going fine and there's no need to improve the process, they're going to find all kinds of ways of keeping that process from being improved. The same thing with management. You have to get senior management buy-in and you got to get staff buy-in. And you really want to be document uh, that to be process once you design it so that you really change it. This is very similar to a software development life cycle. Uh, with, you know, even a uh, in, in a, the most agile environment when I'm doing a sprint, even a one week sprint, I'm going to do Monday looking at my uh, actual work activities, doing requirements, maybe doing a little bit of design, starting to code and test on Friday. Maybe I'm doing test first design. I do my test cases, then I do design. And then Friday, I'm delivering a little bit of code to somebody that actually works. That's still Monday to Friday is pretty much a waterfall life cycle. I do my analysis, I do my development. And but the case of processes is, is at least today, we still have people involved in the process. And with people, people aren't like code. I can't throw a switch on the code on Thursday and suddenly after everything works right. I have to get their buy-in. I have to get their agreement. And I have to train, train, train. And so in my case, business process improvement are taking much longer iterations, uh, four weeks, a month. Uh, but a lot of times we can find parts of the process that we can maybe automate using our PA and do that and install that in the second week of what we're doing. So there's not one way of doing it. This is all where planning becomes key. You need to plan for the environment. I was in one organization that had gone through some a fiasco of process improvement. And the result of that is they said, uh, we can't do any kind of process design. Senior management won't let us. Uh, we use a technique we call brown paper, where you design things on pieces of paper. And they said at one time, the entire 16th floor was pasted with brown paper. We got no benefit from it. And since then, process improvement is a no no word, even though we know we still have to do it. So you, you've got to adjust to the organization. And that's where planning comes in. Not that you follow your plan, but you at least have a starting point of a plan and now have to adjust as you go along. And that's where iteration comes in. Now, I like to develop what I call a process model. And we can do that relatively quickly within a couple of weeks. We have defined what are the core processes and there's no one size fits all. Maybe the organization has the core processes defined already. Maybe not, you'll do it and then create it. As long as you keep it to a fairly reasonable number, like I said, seven, eight, nine, you're okay. And then you can start through interviews and workshops, get a high level understanding of what you think the the major processes are that make up that. And typically for almost all businesses, they follow the same path. Order entry, you know, I have to go out of the catalog, what are the products? Maybe you have to configure them and figure out how to put them all in a case or whatever. But typically there's a logical sequence of things that most organizations follow. That's why SAP and Oracle can come up with standard canned uh, core processes like order to cash. Uh, and, and then once you do that through your interviews, uh, you can start saying, where do you think the problems are? Or just sit down with senior management once that's, that's done, get their agreement and maybe the key managers. And that may not be senior management, the CIO and CEO and CFO. It may be you're working within a division just in sales and just looking at the sales process. And your senior management is the VP of sales and the regional sales managers. Uh, I've been involved with that with uh, chemical uh, pharmaceutical companies 
where they were losing their patent on one product and they were trying to figure out how do they keep the revenue up uh, with that product. And so we were dealing strictly with uh, day-to-day salesmen and sales managers, but we still could do the same thing is how do you did, do your work and say, where are their problem areas? Where do we need to improve? And boy, you know, sometimes management had different views but the key is in order to get their buy-in, you better you much follow with their lead. Even though you're saying, you know, by a measurement, this is a problem area. They think it, the problem area is up here. You have maybe off the half and satisfy them first. So you get the opportunity to work on these process areas next. Once you get those high level areas, you now want to sit down with them and say, how do you prioritize and prioritize iterations? One of the areas that I think is always a challenge is we look at, oh, we could create iterations. I think before you can create iterations, you need to create a framework of where you want to go. What's your overall budget? What's your overall goal? And that framework includes where you want to go, plus an overall architecture of where you want to go. And then you start taking things off uh, the list of work and start actually building it. And you may have to do the infrastructure before you do the high level because you want to increase uh, your volume of sales transactions by an order of magnitude uh, or that you turn on the website and that's going to happen. So you have to oftentimes uh, understand the high level before you can just say, well, I want to take the next most important thing on on my uh, list of work to do. And you do that and you have a first iteration, those green arrows, that's where you want to work, focus first. And then the next one will be the second, maybe you'll overlap them, but probably when you're initially starting and getting the organization trained in how to do process improvement, you don't do that. You focus on getting them done. And then once that's done, then you can go on to the next. And eventually you may get three or four or five different iterations going at the same time. The same thing with agile development, you know, te- learn how to do it first for your organization before you start saying, let's immediately go to the uh, end of the line. And now we're doing five iterations of products at the same time. And the key from here is once I do that, I need to then build the processes. And that gets into a lot of detail uh, in terms of what are the inputs, what are the outputs going back to that uh, SIPOC model, what are the inputs? What are the entry criteria? What are the process steps? What are the roles? That's a very key. We need to say, we may, may create new roles, train people, what tools, or what automation, what are the exit criteria, what measures? I don't measure what I'm doing. It's very hard to improve. And what are the outputs? So there's a lot of detail that needs to be built up here, whether it's robotic process automation or not to make sure that we understand the process and train everybody uh, accordingly. Um, So now let's look at, we have some ideas of process, ideas of process improvement at a high level, where we take our processes and we build in the uh, process descriptions, the flows, the measures, and and move on to some other uh, process improvement techniques. One that was probably more in vogue um, 10 years ago or so, and still in vogue, it's still, we still use it a tremendous amount, but a lot of companies are already implemented it. This is what I'm gonna call business process outsourcing. I think Kodak really started that back in the early 90s when they outsourced their IT services. However, the key is don't always look at process improvement to solve all your problems. Uh, Kodak didn't really understand how to transition from film to electronics and now is long since uh, uh, run away as a, as, a, as a major company in the uh, photo, photographic field. Uh, but typically organizations have processes that are less important to them. And those some examples are call centers and they may find someone who specializes in that They've been doing call centers for years. They have the talent. It may be that they're onshore. Maybe they're offshore. Uh, that can always be an, an issue. We've seen a lot of companies go to 
offshore call centers and then find that customers don't like the fact that they're speaking to people who don't have English as a first language, they don't understand, they can't understand uh, the problem, and they then go to customers, uh, products, companies who have uh, a better customer service. But an awful lot of companies have outsourced call centers. We've outsourced payroll processing for years because oftentimes we don't have the talent to understand the uh, intricacies of tax uh, and tax loopholes, just actually a company that's selling across the board or internationally. We're good at people who are experts at that. We may finance our tax processing. We go to an accountant to do our taxes, or we use uh, uh, a tool that, that's specialized in that, like TurboTax, or I forget what the other one was from uh, some of the other companies. IT services are certainly a big, many, many, most IT organizations have outsourced large parts of their services. And the benefits here can be enormous. Lower costs, they free up internal resources. This is one we have to be careful with. We always say senior management, oh, we'll free up resources and we'll use those resources on, on more higher value added work. A lot of times to get the lower costs, it means cutting staff. And when we do that, that can be a problem for any kind of improvement activity. Uh, and then we can gain the expertise of an outsourcer. I may have outsourcers who really are good at call centers, really understand our problem. They have already been, they've been using Remedy or Salesforce for years and know how to fine tune it to our particular organization. Why not take advantage of that expertise? Issues. I've sat in a number of uh, sales presentations from outsourcing, and they're tremendous, tremendous sales uh, presentations. I, I typically want, even though it's not my group, I want to sign on the line. Can I get that that service if it's that good? And the benefits are often oversold, and this is happening. You really, literally, throughout. It's nothing new. After the Civil War, we had to, you know, uh, you know. A carpet bagger selling uh, a snake oil to cure all our ills. Uh, so there's nothing new here, and I'm sure that goes back to antiquity. Uh, going through the Roman roots, they had uh, in the Colosseum, you know, they have their uh, sales of various uh, products and services, banners to cheer on a certain gladiator or a, a mead or whatever drink that really will uh, make the game go better or beer or whatever. Uh, they have language issues with outsourcers. We've seen that certainly with uh, call centers and a lot of frustration with that. But the outsourcers don't understand the work. I've uh, headed up outsourcing for one of my uh, customers and it took a while to train the outsourcer. And a lot of times we'd get the, I, do you understand what has to be done? And they'd say, yes, we understand. And they really didn't. But that was their uh, philosophy of saying yes. And you really had to go back and say to the, the outsourcer, okay, now if you understand what I just asked you to do, could you repeat it in your own words? And that's when you all can find, find out that they didn't understand. And so if they don't understand the work, that can be a problem. There are special cases come up. They may be long lead times. You have an outsourcer 10,000 miles away. No one wants to bring them on site to, for training. So we try and do remote training. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And if you're in an environment, let's say where there are process changes or new products coming on board, it may be difficult to come keep up with the changes. Um, and, and although BPO is a viable solution for many companies and many companies have already implemented it, I think we really want to focus today on robotic process automation. So let's look at robotic process automation. Uh, what is it? Well, it's the new, new kid on the block, robotic process automation. So I have a process and I create software robots that implement that process for me and they typically automate simple repetitive tasks if each time i do my process i do it a different way it's very hard to write create a robot to do that 
Now, it's really a, a culmination of a couple of key aspects have been happening. Uh, screen scraping, graphical coding techniques, and artificial intelligence. So now we can get more complex processes, complex pro programming, uh, because artificial intelligence can figure out how to do various things that we don't have to just code into the code itself. And this is really key. And these robots, these bots, these software bots, uh, are getting smarter as we get more and more artificial intelligence baked into what they do. RP overall is a part of a trend of low code or no code. Uh, we're trying to get to the point in our society where, where almost everybody learns how to code in, in grammar school and, and are now getting users doing code. And sometimes users can do some really uh, tremendous things. And it's amazing with, with kids in, in, in grammar school can do the code, the games they play or the kind of activities they develop. But not everybody is good at that. Just not everybody can be a quarterback. Not everybody can hit hit a baseball. Not everybody uh, can uh, can get power in golf. And so there are good programmers and bad programmers, good users and bad users. But more and more, we're trying to upload uh, IT onto the users by simple graphical techniques. Choose here, choose here, choose here, and create an application. Even IT is using that. It's not just that. And as we get into the cloud, uh, there's more and more of that going on uh, just because it, we have the tools to actually do that. Now, I said RPA is growing, and it's growing incredibly fast. Really sort of started to take uh, uh, fruition in 2015, 2016, when, when AI started to come on board. And it's been growing like gangbusters. And as the growth is going to be continue, it's probably the, the fastest growing area of IT services today. And there are some of the vendors uh, on the right. Uh, I've worked with Pega. I've been, I've been uh, playing around with UiPath. They all basically have the same idea. They're different contracts, different pricing. You have to get really into the weeds of the details to understand what's best for you. But you know, you can try them out. Uh, they all have different graphical tools. And, uh, you know, many cases, organizations may have multiple vendors in place. Sales is using UiPath. Uh, finance is using Pega. The key is, even with all this, you have to understand your requirements. And if you don't understand your requirements for what you're doing, whether it's a simple robotic uh, automation of a task or a more complex, if the pet requirements are wrong, uh, the application's not going to work. I, we created an application in Pega for one company I worked on, and it really was much. We didn't understand the requirements, and we uh, end up that that version was a failure, and we had to go back to the drawing board and redefine the requirements and start all over again. Now, RPA has a life cycle similar to many other life cycles, uh, with one caveat. Uh, well, two. One, there's a technique that RPA uses called process mining. Well, they'll look at if you have a uh, ERP system like SAP or Oracle involved, they can actually look at that and auto create the process model. I still think it's important to work with senior management that you're working with so they understand the process model and they help prioritize the work. So, just because this is a tool, to me, this is a tool that we can use and integrate into business process improvement as well as RPA. The other difference is we're training users. Some users are better at developers than others. And we're also going to be using consultants to initially train the users, super users who really do understand RPA and create bots for themselves and others and consultants. But we still have to test our bot. Does it do what we want? And once it does what we want, we have to deploy it. It may be if we have 10 people doing the same uh, task and let's say order entry, maybe they're all following a different process and one bot doesn't fit at all. Maybe they, before we create the bot, we should get everyone on the same process and then create a bot to, to, to help us along. RPA vendors claim that it's uh, much quicker and less costly than traditional software. Uh, we can 
debate that. Uh, I think the key is to use the right tool for the right problem. And all these things can go away if they're not done properly. One issue we have with users doing the work though, is they may not have been trained, and I've worked with users in the past in planning, they may not understand planning, they may not understand testing, and they don't do a good job of creating test cases, and they so create their bots, they do a rudimentary test, and when you turn them on in deployment, and the bots are creating more errors than the humans were before, and things get worse instead of get better. And also, they don't understand version control. So you really need to train users in that, how to develop good test cases, how to plan appropriately, particularly iterative planning, and then version control. I've seen someone uh, who created a very elaborate system and then tried to enhance it, didn't save the system before, and got it so messed up that literally he had to go back and do it from scratch. Um, many literally weeks of work because he didn't understand basic version control, which IT has been doing for years. So this is key where it's nice to have the user do the work, but you also have to train them adequately in doing the work. Now, the benefits of uh, RPA. If you go on the RPA sites, the vendor sites, they're in, in incredible benefits. Uh, we saw 67% uh, improvement. They don't say improvement of what, 67% is that versus the humans doing the work before the bot. Bots can do anything. And in reality, that's not the case. You can see shorter implementation times if for certain things, maybe simple products. You know, a very complex order entry system with a lot of configuration management ever is not easy to do and can take a lot of design and development before we get it right. We can reduce long-term costs. Yes, that's true, if done well. Faster processing, more error-free processing. Bots on the plus side are available 24 by seven by 365. They don't get sick. They don't carry on vacation. Uh, human staff is available to do more complex work. Yes, but oftentimes in order to lower these costs, I need to get rid of staff and so, this doesn't always work, which can cause a major problem for uh, any kind of improvement, including robotic process improvement. Bottom line, if I do all those things, I'm going to get happier customers. And if I can get rid of repetitive tasks from my staff and not get rid of them, they can be happier because they have now something doing the repetitive tasks. Costs, the licenses, infrastructure, I've got to build these the applications on something in the cloud. I need to purchase new servers. There's the cost of consultants to help do in planning and design if I'd never done it before. Development and training of staff, support and maintenance. Again, processes change over time, and I need to have you know 1-800 help number or call Bob the super user to help me with the problem. Now, some RPA use cases. Well, one uh, vendor request for information. As we create new websites, as we create to go to trade shows, as we had sales going out and doing uh, marketing campaigns, typically uh, new potential customers are going to say, God, that sounds interesting. I'd like more information about your product. What do we do? They, we have a request for information. Oftentimes, instead of going that to a person that can go to a, a bot, if we standardize the request, and have it automatically send out that right packet of information. And then maybe automatically follow up in a, a week or two of saying, did you get the information? Do you have any questions? There's one company uh, here in the, the uh, a cleaning company that is selling vacuum cleaning services that had a, a 10 point path where after they contacted the client, they'd send out basically information every month or so and they estimate it take 10 months to sell a new, a new customer and their service. I may have uh, vendor data. If I have a lot of small vendors, they all may have the same kind of uh, invoice, but they're slightly different. And I now need to look at that. That's a good area where we're screen scraping. I look at the vendor online. I can turn my bot on to get that data. Who's the vendor? What's the product? What's the price? What's the uh, discounts? 
and automatically enter that into the AP system, a, a good use of uh, our RPA. I may be able to automatically generate the data, regulatory reports, and maybe automatically that I have to do every every month or every quarter, sales proposals, test data, all kinds of things. Assistant call center automation, not by automating the call center process itself where we maybe use Remedy or Salesforce, but now looking at uh, the legacy systems that back it up. A customer calls in with a problem, they may want to look at what did they order? What was in the catalog? What did they actually get? That may be three different systems. And then the complaint system itself. And it may be that once we get the customer information, don't we all hate it when you get, ah, I'm sorry, my system is uh, uh, running very slow today by the call center rep. Or even worse, oh, my system's really slow. It just rebooted and we're gonna have to talk about the weather or whatever for two minutes till I can get back into it and see your record again. Uh, well, the, the bot may be able to auto log on to those systems when you first start talking and then have them all available and maybe take key information. What was the customer's last order? What was the catalog items? What did they actually receive? When did they receive it? And maybe put that all together on a nice simple display uh, instead of having to go to four different systems and going through different legacy systems. And certainly onboarding, this is a big area. Uh, onboarding new employees, uh, training existing employees. And once RPA is really used, the users can really get into them. They can oftentimes give their bots uh, names, personalized names. This is Joey, this is Sam. He does uh, my end of voice consolidation for me. Now, a real life example, and then we'll talk about in integration. Uh, I'm a consultant. I have my own cons company. I create my own timesheets. I keep my own invoices. And some clients want me to enter time in their system as well. And so I have to enter time in my client system and time in my system. Well, that's double entry. They may have different periods. I may one be end, end of month, so on a Tuesday. I have to enter my time in my client system, but I'm on an end of a week period. And so I fill out my timesheet on Friday. And I don't remember exactly what I put in my client timesheet system. And I'm too busy to open it up. So I may thought I put in six hours on one task and I really put in seven and they don't match. The invoice that I create arrives, the code client AP compares the time on file. They don't match, and now there's a dispute. And one company I was with, roughly 20%, 20 to 25% of the invoices had to go into dispute investigation till we were able to improve the basic process. Now, how can RPA help? Well, I can create a little bot that now I enter time in my client system and automatically run that bot and take that information from the client system through screen scraping and enter it in my client's uh, consulting time system. And guess what? The hours always match. I now enter my time at the end of the month into my client system. I, I run the bot, it automatically enters it into my system. Hours match, no disputes. A good use of uh, that. The same thing with invoices. I get invoices from different uh, vendors. They're all different. I can, if they're the same vendor I'm using over and over, I can create bots to auto go through their uh, invoices and enter them into my accounts payable system. There are issues. Uh, our RPA is often overpromised, overhyped, like many other things today. Uh, and we oftentimes don't get the benefits we expect. Uh, and, and that's certainly true of RP if you look at any of their presentations. They can do everything uh, from slice spread and uh, with AI, they're getting more and more capable to take on more, more uh, pro uh, processes. Uh, oftentimes, RP may require additional technologies we didn't count on that. Let's say OCR or vision systems. We may, and this has happened to me, sub-optimize. We select the wrong process and instead of automating it, we eliminate it. I was working with one company where we had a process 
It was costing roughly a, a million dollars a year. Someone, this was before our RPA, wanted to do a Six Sigma project, and they said for 200000 we can cut your costs down to 500000 a year. That's a payoff of less than six months. Why not do it? When we really looked at it from an overall end-to-end process point of view, we didn't really need to do that process. Another division in the company was expertise in doing it, would do it for $20,000 a year. So by that investment of 20,000, obliterating that process, eliminating it, we saved $980,000. And we would, if we automated it, we probably wouldn't have touched it again and looked at it. And we've been spending an extra 500,000 or for, uh, for uh, 80 a year, year after year. So you always have to be careful. Staff resistance particularly as their fear of staff reductions. If the staff thinks you're gonna, instead of, you know, use them on more useful tasks, that there aren't useful tasks and they start getting rid of them, this is good for any kind of process improvement. They're gonna stonewall you. They're gonna find ways to make sure it doesn't work. And then it's, I've mentioned it before, it's difficult keeping processes up to date. And there are a lot of issues with artificial intelligence. If you're creating a bot, to automatically authorize mortgages, and it ends up with a bias. And some uh, group of uh, uh, mortgagees say, oh, they weren't treated fairly and sue you. You can have legal and as well as ethical issues that may cost a lot more than your savings in RPA. So this is an area to be, be careful of. Uh, so what I like to suggest is integrate. Take a look at the high level first. Look at everything, great your overall business model, take a top-down view, and then where appropriate, implement RPA at the right level to automate those processes that are repeatable. Before you do that, if everyone's doing a different process, you may need to redesign the process first using standard business process improvement techniques, workshops, where I rewrite the process definition, the roles, the forms. And once you get that and train people so they're following the new process, which is not easy, then you get into now you can automate it with RPA. If you just focus on low level, you may sub optimize. And I think a lot of organizations are doing that because of the talk, a uh, sales pitch from the RPA vendors is they're going to get this immense benefit when in reality they probably aren't. So we look at the life cycle. Let's take those tools that we can as an old process improvement uh, guru and say, let's use those new tools whenever we can. Let's look at process mining to help us develop the process model, not just interviews. That's a plus. When we get into process design, we we'll keep in back of our mind, can we use RPA to create automatic versions of a process and save us time and steps and focus on the areas that are really more complex and difficult to do. That can be a very useful. And then we build the bots. As we build the bots, we can maybe deploy them before we deploy the process, or maybe not because we need the process. It's very hard to test new processes. Oftentimes you do a pilot, do it in one plant, and if that works there, then we can roll it out to another 10 or 100 or, or uh, uh, 500. And so sometimes we, we may have the bot available and sometimes it's so easy and useful and so saving that we roll it out before we roll out anything else. And maybe that becomes our first iteration because we may have people, I, I work with these RPA tools. They're still programming tools and not everyone's gonna be really good at it. Uh, and then when we look at process improvement, why does it not, work. It's hard work. Why do process improvement projects fail? A lot of the same reasons IT projects fail. The staff's not bought in. Senior management's not bought in. They don't understand processes. They're silos and one group will not talk to another group. You have to break down the silos. Boy, anything will work. Uh, the organization structure just may not be oriented to process view of the work. Uh, very difficult with silos to, to, to do that. Uh, we can go on and on. T tools support the wrong process. Uh, and so we automate the wrong process and now we get sub-optimization. 
So again, process improvement is people intensive. You need to get the staff and management engaged properly for it to work. So I know we're running over, but really go to the, the last slide. We, we've talked a lot about uh, that to be remain competitive organizations need to improve. I think that's something we'd almost all uh, agree on. Maybe not everybody, but certainly I believe it's a mantra of, of today. Processes, not everyone's a, a fan of process. Better to replace the people, but typically they're gonna change the process if we get new people. So processes are really are enduring entities and major standards organizations like uh, SEI, ISO 9000, and the FDA are very much focused on process and it's getting more and more embedded in organizations. And then process improvement is the main way of improving the organization. We looked at a number of different techniques, business process improvement, business process outsourcing, and RPA. I think the key is we use need to use anything that works Anything that will help the organization be more effective, use it, but integrate them for the maximum benefit. And, and if, if you don't, I think you're always going to be suboptimal. And if you're suboptimal, you're going to be good enough and good enough isn't good enough in today's competitive environment. Uh, thank you all. And any questions, you can put them in the chat or the QA and or send me an email. and. Uh, I'll turn this back over to Susan. Great, thank you so much, Larry. Thank you. Yes, we do have some questions um, from our attendees. Our first one is, which organizations are using RPA to offer callers the ability to get a call back instead of having to wait in the queue when they are calling or waiting for a live assistant via chat? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Which organizations are using RPA? I think in many cases, that's probably not RPA but that telephone system that they have tied into their call processing to do uh, callbacks. And uh, I'll tell you almost, uh, if an organization doesn't have that callback and they say I'm number 70 online, I typically say, gosh, I may not want to use that organization more. So and many, many organizations are, I know uh, uh, I've called uh, pharmacies, uh, uh, a number of insurance companies that are all using that technology. Uh, even I think uh, the Social Security Administration does that and does it very effectively. Okay, great, thank you. Our next question is, why do you think government agencies such as the IRS, SSA, DHHS, et cetera, using RPA to automate callbacks to beneficiaries when call volume is so high, which you touched on a little bit? Why do I think they're they're using it? Uh, because in many cases, uh, you know, call volumes are high. We can't always plan for for that. I, I think also, and this goes back to when I first got involved in, in call centers, you know, thirty years ago. Management doesn't want to pay what they 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 need to for uh, for call centers, and so we end up long big times. And that, you know, I'm really tired of hearing when I call a call center. And they say, well, due to uh, uh, large volumes, uh, long waits may be longer than usual. No, that's not the case. You just don't want to add enough staff to handle that because you don't see value added. But to my mind, if I have an issue with a, cu a customer, uh, a vendor, and I'm calling them, uh, that's important for them to handle that properly. Or I might go to another vendor if I can. And I think that's just an area where management short-sighted. Short I was working with one company where, God, uh, wait times for calls were were increasing, and senior management was really happy. And we looked into it, and wait times were calling because people were so tired of waiting that they just drop off the call and solve the problem another way. That's not what you want to have happen. And I, I think government has a lot of legacy systems. We saw that. Uh, with uh, 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 some of the systems early on in, in COVID and workman's comp and, 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 and uh, un unemployment systems are the old COBOL systems that nobody thought of updating because everything was working fine, suddenly getting 10 times the volume they ever got and now we had issues and that's where government went the RPA to instead of fixing these old COBOL systems, which they might not even have the code for, 
and to put some workarounds and RPA can be very good workarounds to uh, give new life to legacy systems. And that's not just the government, that's many customer cust com companies as well. Um, any specific RPA tools or recommendations from your side for any generic or specific process improvement actions, steps, or tasks? Any two cents from your experience? <laughs> I think, and again, I, I probably, I don't want to, I want to be careful here because all, I think the key is I, I listed what are the top vendors you can go to Gartner, get their report, they're all out there. I think you have to look and try, try it out. These are almost all these vendors offer either no cost trials or 30 day trials or in, in case I think of UA path, it's uh, totally free if you're just using it for yourself. And, and try it out and see what the issues are. See how they price, because they price differently. And you have to understand how it how it's deployed. And again, what are your overall goals? Uh, if it's through cost and reducing staff, then that's probably not the best use of RPA. There's a lot of repetitive work. All these tools will work, but they all have different approaches and different programming languages and again, we still are talking programming and, you know, is your staff able to do that? So I would say try it out uh, and uh, do your own uh, understanding of it. And again, a lot of this can be tested out very quickly. They have uh, online demos. I think I was just going through one with uh, uh, UiPath and uh, uh, two hours uh, and you can learn how to program in UiPath and get a sense for what it's like. And, and play with it. And and uh, uh, PEGA uh, is another one. All, all these tools are very easy to use, but bottom line, they're still programming tools. Is there any no-code RPA platforms you recommend to automate or improve business processes? Well, they're all no-code in the sense that they all have some graphical user interface that I pick and choose uh, something from a screen here, a message there, I do a simple calculation here. So I, it, it's really not no code, just because there's a graphical user interface, they're still programming my, um, my, my grandkids uh, doing programming on a simple tool. It's still programming, I'm putting various activities together step-by-step step, and they always run through the same way and there's, decisions involved, uh, if thens. Uh, so, it, but it is low code, it makes it a lot easier. And I think even for IT professionals, uh, we're all getting more into the graphical user interface to make our lives easier and, and more consistent. And they do a whole bunch of things, uh, you know, just to open up a, a email and send out an email. There's a whole bunch of steps where it's just one uh, activity in uh, these low-code tools. Thank you, Larry, for presenting with us today. Thank you, Susan, my pleasure.